Well, hey, hi, everybody. Um, there will be no announcements today other than please turn off your cell phones. Okay, so that's it. That's simple enough. Uh, there actually are no announcements today, so anyway. Uh, I have a lot to cover today, so I am going to uh, ask you that, uh, that we have a very short break uh, because I will never get done with this otherwise, and I will, do not want to cut into um, my beloved Dr. Kicklater's very important time. So uh, with that said, we're going to talk today about the use of the bomb and Japan's decision to end the war because, again, the only people that can really end the war are the Japanese. So, when we started this class, we talked about revisionist history. And quite honestly, the standard version of the end of World War II with the use of the atomic bomb is simply that by dropping the bomb, we ended the war, we did not need to invade Japan, and we saved a huge amount, hundreds of thousands of U.S. casualties. That's the standard ending of the war. After the war ended, really shortly after, the, many people started to question the use of the bomb itself. And then by the 1980s and 1990s, when more and more uh, information had been sent out as far as uh, decoding and uh, you know, U.S. capabilities on decoding, as that information began to be sent out and people could look at it, more and more revisionist histories became uh, popular. So the first one would be that the atomic bomb was used against Japan due to racism. The second, the bomb was dropped as a demonstration to the USSR uh, that we had the bomb and it was to contain communist expansion. The third is that if we had demonstrated the power to the bomb to the Japanese, that we would have been able, they would have surrendered just because they would see that we had the bomb. And the last, and perhaps the most uh, prevalent, particularly in the 80s and the 90s, was that the Japanese were going to surrender, and had we said that they could keep the emperor as a sovereign ruler, that indeed they would have surrendered and there was no need to drop the bomb. Okay. Well, how was the Japanese government structured at the end of World War II? There was a, this group of six people, uh, the Supreme Council for Direction of the War. Those people basically were five military officers and one civilian, the civilian being uh, Togo, the foreign minister. The way their government worked is that they had to come to a consensus. So this group would come to a consensus. The, uh, rest of the government still existed. You may remember that I said that Kanoe had gotten rid of the political parties in 1940, but the rest of the government was still there realistically. So they would, the big six, would send, uh, come to a consensus. They would then present that consensus to the regular government. The regular government would rubber stamp it. They would send that to the emperor. The emperor would rubber stamp it, and that was then policy of the Japanese government at the end of the war. So really, in a lot of ways, these people and the emperor, the imperial power, are actually the leaders of Japan. So Japan's leadership is all consolidated into this group. Now, I have listed their names, and you may see that, for example, Suzuki, and you may remember Suzuki, he was the man at the 226 incident that was shot multiple times. His wife interceded between the assassins and said, just let him die, I will let, take care of him. And they basically said, okay, they saluted him and walked out the door. Uh, of course, he does not die, and now he is prime minister of Japan. The only civilian, like I said, is Togo. Now, if you notice that I've got ones and fours on each person's name, if you're a one, you are a one condition for uh, surrender. And that condition would be that the emperor maintains his power as a sovereign ruler. If you are a four, then what that means is that you have four conditions. And those conditions, of course, are the emperor stays in power, that war crimes will be uh, handled by the Japanese government. In other words, they will conduct their own war crime trials. The 
Japanese government will have self-disarmament. They will disarm their own troops themselves. And most importantly, is they will not have any occupation of Japan. So that's the ones and the fours. And this will become very important as we go on. Well, now who is in charge of the imperial power, of course, is Emperor Hirohito. And Emperor Hirohito has a very close confidant, uh, Marquis Kido, and he is the Lord Keeper of the Privy Seal. He is also the emperor's closest confidant. And as you may remember during the 226 incident, what he did was he is the man that urged the emperor to come down hard on the rebellion. So Kido had played a key role in the 226 incident as well. Well, the biggest piece with the, like I said, with the uh, revisionist history frequently is these communications between uh, Togo, the uh, foreign minister, and Sato. And Sato is the ambassador to Moscow for the Japanese government. Now, everything we're going to talk about now, if it's highlighted in red or in quotes, is actual decryptions of Japanese communications. As you may remember, I've talked about this numerous times, but just as a reminder, the Japanese have, we've been reading their mail forever. So the magic diplomatic piece, the diplomatic messages that they send out are magic. We were reading those, for example, well before Pearl Harbor. Since that time, we have now had significant increase in the ability to read Japanese military codes. And as I had mentioned, by this time in the war, we are reading one million Japanese army codes alone per month. So every time they basically send out a message, we can read it. And frequently, we actually read them before the Japanese recipient because we have that much capability. So keep that in mind. There's two pieces. There's diplomatic and, of course, which is magic, and there is military codes, which are ultra. Yes? Just reading them is one thing, but how about collating the data that's received? How do they know where to send that to? Whose eyes does it go to? How do they... Oh, it's, they, they can tell exactly who it's sent to. That's what I mean. We can tell exactly who they're sending you to. Who is the we? Uh, we have several major, the question is, is how do we know where, if they intercept a message, how do we know where this data is actually being, who is it being sent to? In our government. In our government, right. right. So the, it's simple enough. They have, you know, if I address a message to you, I have addressed a message to you. It's the same thing with when you send a radio communication. When they address a message to somebody, it's addressed to you. We can read that. We have major intelligent groups that summarize all these communications. So it's naval intelligence? Naval intelligence, army intelligence, uh, regular uh, diplomatic intelligence. We have a huge, huge capability to read these messages. Again, we're reading many times before they even read them. It's pretty amazing how much we've gathered of information from the Japanese. The other, and just real quick, and I shouldn't go off topic, but we are actually taking Japanese dispatches from Berlin, from their ambassador to Germany, and using that to figure out German policy. There's a major book on that. I would highly recommend it. So. Uh, I can't think of the title off the top of my head, but I will send that out via email. But we actually are using the Japanese ambassador to spy on the Germans. So, again, all these are real quotes. So, Togo, who is the foreign minister, sends this message to Sato, who is the ambassador to Moscow, and he says, we are secretly giving consideration to ending the war. He wants him to meet with Molotov. Molotov is the foreign minister of the Soviet Union. And he wants to have this meeting very quickly because he knows that the, the Allied powers and the Russians are going to have a meeting at the uh, German city of Potsdam. Oh, by the way, <coughs> what he's offering is a renunciation of the Portsmouth Treaty. You may remember that from 1905. 
uh, the Portsmouth Treaty basically gave the Japanese the uh, uh, half of Sakhalin Island, the Kuril Islands, and control of North Korea. So, on July 12th, Togo sends another message. And he says, quote, as long as England and the U.S. insist upon unconditional surrender, there is no alternative but to fight on. Well, again, the U.S has analysis of all these communications, and we are using, for example, for this analysis, Joseph Gru, who was the former ambassador to Tokyo, and Gru takes this, all this data and comes up with the thinking that what indeed the Japanese are trying to do is they're trying to buy off the Russians, uh, give them, you know, some easy gains in the, in the Asian area, and take that, in, and then they are going to use that time to perhaps develop war weariness in the United States. So they're basically trying to play the Russians off, keep the Russians out of the war, give them something, and hope that the United States and Britain become so war weary that we will not continue to try to have unconditional surrender. But remember, the Allied goal is, is not to allow that. The Allied goal is unconditional surrender because what they're trying to do is they're trying to prevent future wars. And they feel that if you have a democratic government, democratic governments are much less likely to go to war and that way there will not be future wars. So they must, as far as the Allies are concerned, they must get rid of the government of Germany and they must get rid of the government of Japan and replace that with democratic governments. He was the former ambassador to, to Japan. U.S. ambassador. And he was the uh, ambassador when the war started. He was in Japan when the war started. And then uh, early in 42, they exchanged uh, the ambassadors. They were put on neutral ships and sent back. So Sato, who's very much a realist, is not buying off on, on what he's being told to do by Togo. And he says this, he goes, how much do you expect our statements of non-annexation, non-possession of territories we have already lost or are about to lose will have on Soviet authorities? We certainly will not convince them with pretty little phrases devoid of all connection with reality. If the Japanese empire is really faced with the necessity of terminating the war, we must first make up our opinion to terminate the war. Then, he goes on to say that the only thing they can really expect to get out of this is virtually the equivalent of unconditional surrender. This is Sato. So he's not fooled at all by what's going on with the Japanese government and, and Togo. And Togo on July 15th says, you know, they've got all these problems, but then Sato goes, is asking a question, because remember, the big six has to come to a consensus. The, the emperor has to come to a consensus. And he's asking the question, where is this inform where is these requests coming from? Indeed, are you representing all of the big six? Are you representing the emperor? Who are you speaking for? Because I'm not going to go to the Russian government and make these, you know, odd proposals and try to get them to, to help us without knowing if indeed we are making a serious effort to end the war. And so he constantly asks about this lesser warrant. In other words, is in fact the big six all in agreement on this? Well, of course they're not. And Togo on July 17th responds that, uh, Bear in mind, there's no way they will accept anything like unconditional surrender. They are not going to accept that. Why are they not going to accept that? And they, because the army, under Anami particularly, is definitely against this. The army feels the only way they will possibly surrender is if they can say that they didn't lose the war. It's very similar to Germany in 1918. So in other words, we were never conquered, we didn't really lose the war, so we were actually okay. Things didn't go as badly as they seemed. 
Well, again, the U.S. is having magic summaries. We are taking all this information that we get and we're putting it together into, you know, into a serious doctrine, in effect. And they note that, you know, that, that Sato is actually talking about unconditional surrender as long as they will preserve the position of the emperor. And again, on July 21st, Togo's response is, with regard to unconditional surrender, we are unable to consent to it under any circumstances. And it further states, even more strangely to me, is that it would be disadvantageous and impossible from the standpoint of foreign domestic considerations to make a declaration even of specific terms. So they're not even offering any terms to the Allies that would possibly not only be something we would accept, but in fact, they're not sending out any terms at all. <coughs> well, U.S. naval intelligence, in this case, is taking the information from MAGIC, all these communications, and they're also taking all the communications from ULTRA. And what the difference is, is you can see with the ULTRA communications, that the Japanese army is totally committed to the last battle of Japan. They're not committed at all to this thing with Russia. They are totally convinced that what they can do, and you may remember this, is they can have Ketsugo. And Ketsugo is the defense of the island of Kyushu, which we talked about in depth in a previous class, where they have taken all these troops now and put them on Kyushu in the hopes that they will be able to defeat the Allies in Japan, or at least make it so bloody and terrible that the U.S. population will indeed say, enough of this, this war is over, we're not going to do this. This is out of control that the U.S. will not be able to sustain this number of casualties. So Togo has basically rejected the one condition in these communications, but also we know that the military government of Japan is no way is ever going to surrender at this point. So these communications we know aren't really very accurate. So again, and what they say is, there is little likelihood that they will accept any peace terms satisfactory to the Allies until they realize the invasion can't be repelled. So until they realize that Ketsugo is not going to work, they are, have no intention whatsoever of having peace. So, revisionist historians argue that Japan was near surrender when well, we decided to use the bombs. Well, that's again, if you take selected excerpts of what the communications between Togo and Sato are, it indeed seems that they were close to surrender. But what that fails to understand is that the military part of the Japanese government had no, con no desire whatsoever to surrender as long as Ketsugo was a possibility. So there's never any peace terms agreed to by the emperor. There's never peace terms even presented. We won't present any peace terms because we don't really believe in it. And again, if the U.S. had promised to keep the emperor, this is a key piece for revisionist history. And you can see that the answer to this assertion is enshrined in black and white on the July 22nd edition of the Magic Diplomatic Summary. There, Sato advised Togo the best terms they could hope for was unconditional surrender, modified only that the imperial institution could be retained. Togo expressly rejected it. Given this, there is no rational prospect that such an offer would have won support from any of those other five members. So it's just basically not going to happen. Well, so the other piece that you have to think about in this regard with the, with the Japanese and the U.S. is remember at Pearl Harbor, an hour after they bombed Pearl Harbor, the Japanese diplomats were still making presentations to the U.S. government, being unaware that they, we, they had already bombed Pearl Harbor. So the odds that the U.S. is going to believe anything that a Japanese diplomat says that isn't part of the military is very slim. We have no reason whatsoever to believe these people. We do believe that they're military because we know their military controls their government. So, from downfall, page 239, 
In the face of this evidence, it is fantasy, not history, to believe that the end of the war was at hand before the use of the atomic bomb. All right, the Potsdam Conference, which I mentioned briefly. The Potsdam Conference is a group, uh, grouping of the, uh, the British, the French, the US, the Russians, and the Chinese primarily in Potsdam, Germany. This is after Germany has been defeated. Uh, the conference goes on for an incredibly long time from July 17th till August 2nd. The reason that is, is there was an election in Britain and Churchill loses the election and they have to bring in a new British government in the middle of this conference. So that tends to slow things down significantly. Well, they're going to, at this conference, they're going to discuss how does the war end in Europe, how are we going to wrap things up there, and how is the continuation of the war in, against Japan going to go? Well, at this time, we're encouraging the USSR to get into the war. The question we would have, perhaps, is why are we encouraging them to get into the war? And simple enough. Remember, there are two million Japanese troops scattered throughout Asia. And those two million Japanese troops, we are not aware that even if we conquer the home islands of Japan, if indeed those Japanese will surrender. So the hope is that the USSR will get into the fight, that they will indeed help us to defeat Japanese uh, soldiers that are not in Japan itself, but are on the Asian mainland, particularly Manchuria and Korea, and that that will be a huge help for us because we won't have, have less Japanese to worry about. And again, we're very afraid, that over and over you see this, that there, the U.S. government is afraid that there will be another 20 Okinawas where the Japanese garrisons throughout Asia will just fight to the last man and we'll just have to, the war will just keep going on and on and on. So the other thing that happens at the Potsdam Conference, the day before the Potsdam Conference, we test uh, the Trinity test happens, where we use the uh, implosion or the plutonium bomb. Remember, there's two types of bomb. There's a little boy that's a gun bomb that uses pure U-235. That's a bomb that's very reliable. They think. They don't even bother to test it. But they're not so sure that the plutonium bomb, by using implosion to squeeze that little orange of plutonium down to a, a critical mass, will actually work. Well, they test that bomb in Alamogordo, New Mexico. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. And what happens at that point is, is the bomb works really well, and Truman makes a comment to Stalin. He goes, well, you know, hey, we got this new bomb, and, you know, this is going to be kind of cool. And Stalin's like, hey, that's a great idea. You go ahead and use that bomb, because we like that bomb. And, of course, what Truman doesn't realize is that Stalin knows all about the bomb because he's got spies all over uh, Los Alamos and other places. And so there's no secret to the Russians that indeed we've been building this weapon. But they test that. <coughs> and then what happens is the British, the Chinese, and the Americans come up with a thing called the Potsdam Declaration. Uh, it asks for the unconditional surrender of the Japanese military. Uh, it is a continuation of Roosevelt's original policy from 1943 that there would be no harm to the average people of the Axis nations. And also at the same time, we tell Russia what they're going to get for being part of the war, because they're not going to do this for free. So we say, hey, well, you know, we can have, you can have this, that, and the other thing. Basically, it's they get the same thing the Japanese were offering was the difference between the Portsmouth Treaty. So, yeah, so they're going to get compensated for ending the war, and the, the Russians tell the allies, the Western allies, that it will be three months for them to get from uh, taking over the end of you know, the war in Germany to the, when they can get to and attack the Japanese. Yeah, they were, but very, the, well, the question is, were the French involved in this? Yes, they were, but they were not involved with the War of Japan at all. They were never a uh, part of that. Yes, sir? Frank, uh, they had not yet renounced the non-aggression pact between the 
between the Soviet Union and Japan, has it? The Soviet. Yeah, the question is, is had they renounced the pact uh, uh, between the Soviets and the Japanese? Remember, we talked about that in a previous class. They had said that they, the pact would not be renewed, and the pact would expire in 1946. So to your point, yes, the pact is still you know, in effect. Of course, what do pacts mean? <laughs> <laughs> Who was Great Britain's representative there? I think Clement Attlee. I think that was, is that correct? Clement Attlee wasn't he there? Yeah, I believe that's right. So, uh, yeah. So, this is the Potsdam Declaration. The Japanese military forces will be completely disarmed, and then the soldiers will be permitted to go home and lead productive lives. Uh, they don't intend to destroy the Japanese people or enslave them, uh, but they will prosecute the war criminals. Uh, the Japanese government shall remove all obstacles to the revival of democracy, so in other words, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, etc. Japan shall be permitted to maintain industries they won't be able to control the natural resources, which is why they went into the war. They'll have to give back Manchuria, for example, in Korea, but they will be allowed at a future date to trade. They will be allowed to buy natural resources from other countries, but they will not be able to keep their um, ill-gotten gains. And occupying forces shall withdraw uh, as soon as these things have been accomplished, and they call on the government of Japan now to surrender all armed forces. Again, not to surrender all the people, surrender the armed forces. But if they don't do that, we promise them prompt and utter destruction. Well, the Japanese, uh, and you may remember Prime Minister Suzuki, you know, he's, he's still around. Res He's a one. Okay, he says his response to this Potsdam Declaration is mokusatsu. Well, what does mokusatsu mean? Well, it can mean two different things. Let's say we're at a party and you're talking to somebody you don't know real well, or you're talking to somebody you do know pretty well, and they some, say something either really offensive or really stupid. And you know, you're like, oh, I don't want to get involved with this. So, I mean, you're liable to just not say anything and just kind of hope that, you know, this goes away. Uh, and I'm sure we've all been in that situation where you just literally don't know what to say to somebody so you don't want to cause a problem, so you just kind of just, you know, hide or just shut up. Or it can mean another thing. It can mean to treat with silent contempt. So in other words, it's a much different situation. Well, the U.S. government interprets mokusatsu as to treat with silent contempt. And what do we do then? Well, we're going to give them prompt and utter destruction. And hence, we decide to use the atomic weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You can see the two detonations here. The detonation on the left actually is Hiroshima. It's much smaller than the detonation on the right, which is Nagasaki, which was the implosion bomb, significantly more powerful. And Truman is told of the bomb only after he becomes president. So when he's vice president, he doesn't even know this is going on. He has no idea that we're making atomic weapons whatsoever. And he's going to have to make the choice of deploying this weapon. But all his advisors literally are saying that this is exactly what we should do. We should deploy these weapons. And Truman comes to the conclusion that the only reason we should use this weapon is if it's going to end the war. So it, the, it still rages today about the first use of atomic weapons. But my feeling is really kind of this. I think the scientists had a really good idea of what these things really were. Uh, Leo Zillard comes to mind, for example. Uh, they knew that they were dealing with something very, very, very potent. 
I'm not so sure that the military and the US government actually understood this as well. And the thinking here is, and I'm going to say some things here that you're going to probably find fairly amazing. For example, they believed that only, uh, you only had to be over 3,500 yards away from an atomic explosion, and then gamma radiation would not kill you. 3,500 yards is two miles. Well, of course, gamma radiation will be much farther than that. They also thought that it would probably be OK one hour after a nuclear explosion to go and walk around, and, and there should be no problem with radiation one hour later. Well, of course, we know, of course, that's completely wrong. So I really, really think that these guys didn't have a really great handle on what they actually had in their hands. Again, they've never seen one. The bombs themselves really are not weapons. They're really science projects. And they just, you know, hey, this is probably a great idea. Let's use these bombs. So Arthur Compton, who, by the way, won the uh, Nobel Prize uh, in 1927, I believe, for uh, discovering the Compton effect, which we're not going to go into. But the fact of the matter is, is Arthur Compton is the, basically the leader of the scientific group that's part of the advisory to the government. And the, some of the scientists, particularly Zillard and Ernest Lawrence, they would like to have, instead of dropping this bomb on the Japanese people or a Japanese military target, they would very, very much like to have a demonstration of this weapon rather than using it on a target. And they try to come up with different ideas of how they could possibly do this. And they, well, if they tell the Japanese that on, you know, 3 o'clock in the afternoon there's going to be a giant explosion over Tokyo Bay, there's a possibility that the Japanese would send fighter planes to attack our bombers, because we're basically telling them where this is going to happen. There's also the possibility, remember, this isn't a tested weapon, that it could fail. And they can't come up with anything that's reasonable that the Japanese might actually believe that would safely show that this weapon was actually effective or what it really was. Remember, even people in the US government don't really believe what it really is. We don't really know. Well, Lawrence basically says, or Compton says, that there's no way this is really going to work, so we can't do this. But what it's interesting is, even after we dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, some parts of the Japanese military said that really the atomic bomb's not that big a deal as long as you're underground, you're safe. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, okay. But seriously, so uh, there was really no way that they could come up with any logical or believable method to demonstrate this capability to the Japanese. So the decision is made to drop the bomb. Well, the whole 50s preparedness was based on that. I'm sorry? I said the whole 50s preparedness in the U.S. after the bombs right. was based on the, if you're just underground, you'll be safe. <laughs> but yeah, well, so. Right. It's a, well, I mean, it, it, I could go on for a long way on this one, but for example, to your point that radiation knowledge was very poor, you could not find a Russian submariner from uh, the 50s and early 60s. There are no Russian submariners alive that served on nuclear submarines. Why is that? Well, because when they would pull the rods out of their reactor, unlike the US would an enclosed reactor and we would use a magnetic capability to pull those rods out of the reactor, the Soviets had a system where you would stand there with a block and tackle and a chain and you would pull it out. And because of communist solidarity, uh, if there was a leak in a reactor, that leak was spread to the entire submarine so everybody would share the effects. So there are no there are no Soviet submariners alive from that time frame. They're all dead. They all had radiation problems. Well, <laughs> so we did talk about the 509 composite group. Uh, that is the group that is uh, going to drop the actual atomic bombs. Uh, they are controlled, uh, they're led by this gentleman here, Paul Tibbetts. 
Uh, he's an incredibly competent bomber pilot, uh, and actually was a private pilot for General Eisenhower in Europe. And the group was first organized into two separate sections. One group was to bomb Germany, to drop atomic weapons on Germany. The other one was to de designed to drop atomic weapons on Japan. Well, before the atomic bomb is finished, Germany has surrendered. So we never can drop a bomb on Germany because they weren't available. But we fully intended to do such. So it's designed as a composite group. It's completely self-contained. Uh, they have all their own people. They have all their own maintenance. They have everything they need. So they don't have to associate with anybody else. So that causes some interesting situations because they are shipped to Tinian Island and they are in a private area of Tinian Island. They're fenced off. Uh, their security is tight. And they don't fly regular missions with the rest of the B-29 force. Well, the rest of the B-29 force can't really figure out what it is these guys are doing. Why don't they fly with us? Why don't they drop bombs with us? Why don't they go on the same missions we do? And they start making, basically, jokes about them. And there's a little ditty, and I won't go through the whole thing, but it says, basically, take it from one who knows the score, the 509th is winning the war, because nobody ever sees what they do. What are they doing? They launch missions where they drop what they call a pumpkin. A pumpkin is the shape of a fat man bomb. It is painted bright orange, and it's filled with conventional explosives. So little three-plane groups of B-29s fly over Japan. They drop one bomb on Japan, and then they make a radical maneuver and get away. Well, Japanese are two things are happening here. They're learning how to be more accurate with their equipment. And the second thing they're learning is that the Japanese are learning that these three plane raids are really no big deal. So the Japanese become used to the fact that indeed these little three plane groups fly over Japan. Well, they do this for a reason too. They drop that bomb into the wind. When they drop that bomb into the wind, they make an incredibly radical turn. And remember, they're using a silver plate B-29. A silver plate B-29 has been specifically configured for this piece. It has no turrets, so it's more streamlined. It weighs less. It has fuel-injected engines. So it's faster and higher flying than a regular B-29. Why is it faster? Because it needs to get the hell out of Dodge before that bomb goes off. So, and they're optimized for that task. All right, so the first bomb dropped is the little boy. That's the bomb they don't even bother to test. That is a U-235 uranium bomb. It's the gun, so in other words, you fire one piece of U-235 and a gun into the other piece, and that sets off a critical mass and it causes the explosion. And that's on August 6, 1945. It's highly inefficient. Remember, it was 141 pounds of U-235 only about 2.6 pounds of that actually fission, but it still creates a blast of 12.5 oh, to 15 kilotons. And it destroys 4.7 square miles of Hiroshima. It causes 80,000 deaths, mostly due to blast and the resulting firestorm, but also gamma rays and radiation take a significant toll. Yes? The question is the 4.7 miles, is it just shockwave or fires? And it's both. It can, it's the firestorm as well. The Nagasaki mission takes place on August 9th, only three days later. And this is critical because, I'm not really going to try to make this quick, but the fact of the matter is, is we make a decision to drop the next bomb as quickly as we possibly can. And the reason we're doing that is because the Japanese have a nuclear program. They have an idea of how nuclear bombs are made. This is not a big secret. They just don't have the capability to do this. Remember, only the United States has had the capability in the entire world to put the amount of natural resources and money into making such a pie-in-the-sky science project, because nobody's sure it's going to work. 
So you have to invest a huge amount of money and build the world's largest factory, for example. And as the numbers we talked about, 75,000 people working in you know, Oak Ridge and another 60, 70,000 working in Hanford. We're the only country that has the capability to put this kind of resources into it. So the Japanese will be convinced that we don't have a lot of these weapons. Because again, it's so incredibly difficult to separate U-235. Most likely they have no idea about how plutonium works. Don't know that for a fact, but I'm pretty confident. that I do know the Japanese think that we wouldn't have very many of these weapons. So we decided to drop the next bomb very quickly to show them perhaps that we do have a lot of these weapons. Well, the raid on Nagasaki is just an unmitigated disaster. The plane takes off, it's called Boxcar, and if you'd like to see this aircraft, you can see it uh, at the uh, uh, United States Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio. It's there to be viewed. Um, it takes off and it's got a fuel pump problem. So 600 gallons of fuel are trapped. It can't use them. They decide to go on with the mission anyway. They fly to uh, by Iwo Jima where they're supposed to meet other aircraft. They don't see the other aircraft. They circle around for about 45 minutes and finally decide, look, we're just going to have to go because we can't waste any more time. We're running out of fuel. And they begin to head to Kokura. There is a weather plane at Kokura that says that it's got good visual bombing capability. Remember, they can only bomb visually. They are not allowed to use radar to drop an atomic bomb. Well, they get to Kokura, there's clouds. They go back around Kokura, there's clouds. They go back around Kokura a third time. There's clouds, and now there's Japanese fighters coming up. And they decide, OK, we're running out of fuel. We still got this bomb. We got to do something. So they go to Nagasaki. They only have enough time to make one run over Nagasaki. And a miracle occurs, and the clouds part, and they drop the bomb on Nagasaki. The problem is, is they missed their aim point by approximately three miles. So my suspicion is, is that the clouds didn't part, and they dropped the bomb on Nagasaki through radar. Well, when they did drop the bomb on Nagasaki, it lands in a valley. And so consequently, the valley contains the explosion. Not only does it contain the explosion, but the happen to be the aim point is very close to the largest Catholic cathedral in Japan, which is completely destroyed. And they kill a large percentage of the Catholics of Japan because that's where they lived. So it's probably not where they were intending to drop that bomb. This is the runway on Tinian in 2019. You can see here that it's being overtaken by the jungle, I guess you can, well, not jungle, but the foliage. And those four runways and that airbase was the largest airbase in the world in 1945. Today it's completely abandoned. You can see this picture of yours truly there on the left. Uh, that is the runway of the, uh, where the bomb took off. The little arrow on my shoulder there is the direction that the plane flew in. And the gentleman on the right in the red shirt is Richard B. Frank, the author of the book that I recommended for this class. So that is an incredible experience for me, was driving down that runway. It was, it was very eerie. To, to take a car and drive down that road. You can't land a plane there any longer. And just to see how it was to look to the people in those aircraft taking off day after day to bomb Japan. No, they didn't use Martsen mats there. They used crushed coral. The question is, is they still have the steel landing mats. They didn't use Marston mats at the, this kind of a facility. This is the bomb pit for the bomb on Tinian. You can see the staircase there, so you can get an idea of how deep that is. The bombs were too large for the planes to roll over them and again get loaded with a bomb. So they made these pits. The bomb would be lowered into the pit on a hydraulic jack. Uh, the hydraulic, you know, you've probably seen your car up on a hydraulic jack. Well, the same idea is this bomb would be put on a hydraulic jack and then lifted into the aircraft. 
So that is the only real remnants on Tinian of uh, evidence of these uh, occurrences. And you may notice that the, it's got a uh, aluminum and glass cover over the bomb pits to preserve them. But that's really the only thing that's there is a few plaques and this. There's nothing really else there but these bomb pits. 10,000 pounds. How much did the bombs weigh was the question, and they weighed 10,000 pounds. Yeah, which actually is well below the capability of a B-29 to carry it. They could carry 20,000 pounds. But the ball, the shape was not. They're big, so they couldn't get over the plane. All right, so let us take a very short break. I still got a long way to go, so. But we're going to get to the end of war eventually, so. So, all right, Russians, they do have a pact that's good till 1946 with the Japanese, but that goes in the garbage. And they decide on August 8th, that night, late at night, that they're going to invade uh, Manchuria, or as it's known at that time as Manchuko. Uh, it is the head of state for Manchuko, uh, is actually the em former emperor of China, who was a young boy when he was deposed. There's a movie about it you might want to watch. Uh, so the Japanese have the Kwantung Army in Manchuria used to be the most important battle force in Japan. It was the number one group. And they had to basically strip this group of key divisions. They would send them out to Pacific Islands. Uh, remember, there was the huge offensive in China that basically knocked the nationalist Chinese government out of the war for all a point and effect. Uh, and so the Kwantung Army is basically just a shell of its former self. It has a lot of divisions, but the divisions are under-equipped, the people aren't properly trained, and they do not have a lot of mechanized equipment. They are now being faced by a Russian army that has just defeated the Germans, that has some of the world's best tanks, and many of them. It is on wheels by all of the thousands of the U.S. trucks that we have given them that the Japanese, by the way, let sail right past Japan. And <laughs> so they are in trouble, big time. It's a completely successful offensive as far as the uh, early parts of it goes. Some of the Japanese units do indeed fight to the death. The Russians take significant casualties, which they underplay greatly. Uh, and what happens is, is the at Potsdam, we had made an agreement with the Russians that they would stop at the 38th parallel. And interestingly to me, we had no troops in Korea whatsoever, no way to stop them. The Russians actually do stop on the 38th parallel. Well, when they stop on the 38th parallel, as you can see on this map, they create what we know today of as North Korea. And we, later on, after the war is over, occupy South Korea, and we create the South Korean government. Now, you may know this, and but just in case you don't, uh, to this day, Russia does indeed share a border with North Korea. And of course, the Chinese share a border with North Korea as well. So when we attempt to embargo North Korea, it's probably not going to be 100% effective because our good friends, the Russians, and the Chinese are not going to particularly be part of that, so they can, goods can flow back and forth over that border. For example, one of the goods that has flown over that border is the fact that the, the North Korean intercontinental ballistic missiles are all powered with Soviet-era rocket engines. Now, I don't know where they got them, but they came from somewhere. <laughs> so. The other piece the Russians are doing, again, remember that Portsmouth Treaty, what did they lose? They lost half of Sakhalin Island, they're going to get it back. They lost the Kuril Islands, they're going to get them back. And they also decide as late as 822.45, remember the Japanese have already surrendered by this time, 822. They're, they haven't signed yet, but they're surrendered. They're going to invade Hokkaido. Hokkaido is the northernmost main island on the, of Japan, of the home islands. 
And the Japanese, because they have put so much effort into defeating us in Kyushu and on the Kanto Plain by Tokyo, have stripped Hokkaido of virtually all capability. There's only like two little divisions on the entire island of Hokkaido. We have destroyed the Japanese Navy, so the Japanese Navy has no capability to stop the Russians from invading, even though the Russians have very little sea lift capability, particularly compared to us. They still will be able to bring in little groups, enough troops where most people feel that indeed they would have been easily able to take the northernmost island of Japan, which would have been Hokkaido. Well, Truman at Potsdam had said that the Japanese were going to be our business as far as the home islands, and the Russians were not going to be part of this. So since they were not going to be part of this, when Stalin decides that he's going to invade Hokkaido, Truman gets wind of this and makes a strong statement to the Soviets that indeed, we don't want this going on. Well, the Soviets realize that they don't have any sort of naval power that can compete with our Navy, and that if we want to at any time, we can basically cut them off from being resupplied or, or doing anything there. And actually, Stalin does back down from invading Hokkaido. Right, why is there a line in the middle of Stockholm? Because that's where the northern part was Russian and the southern part was Japanese. That's kind of how where they divided the island. So, again, Truman prevents that situation from happening. Well, if we think about this now, when the Russians invaded Manchuria, Sakhalin Island, uh, the Kerr Isles, they took 2,726,000 Japanese nationals, prisoner in effect, one-third of those being military. Many of these people are sent to Siberia to help rebuild the Soviet Union. Of that 2,726,000, only 2,379,000 ever returned to Japan. They believe in the first winter alone, 179,000 Japanese civilians died and 66,000 soldiers died under Russian captivity. They had surrendered, and then they basically shipped them off to Siberia to work in the, you know, the gulag. So, if you think about it, without our intervention, there's a very good possibility that Hokkaido, Japan, would now be the equivalent of a Japanese North Korea. Well, August 9th, remember the Soviets invaded late on August 8th, they decide to have an imperial conference because they're very, very upset that the Russians have done this. And they're having a conference about this on August 9th. As we know, August 9th is the day that we bombed Nagasaki. And indeed, while they're in the middle of this conference, the Big Six and the Emperor, they are informed that, they, uh, that we have bombed Nagasaki. And they are very, very, very upset about this because they, again, believe that we couldn't possibly have very many of these bombs. And all of a sudden, it's only three days later, and now another city has been hit. So they know that the city hasn't been damaged nearly as badly as Hiroshima, but they don't realize at the time that the reason has been damaged less is that the bomb missed its target by a significant amount and fell into a valley. Well, they also capture a gentleman called Lieutenant McDilda. And Lieutenant McDilda is a P-51 pilot. He is stationed on Iwo Jima. He is flying missions to escort B-29s to bomb Japan. He is actually at Iwo Jima when they find out about the bomb being dropped on Hiroshima. He is ghost. One of the guys in his unit, I'm not sure who, but uh, knows a little bit about physics. So he knows a little bit about physics and says, you know, gives like a little lecture on how perhaps the atomic bomb worked. Well, the next day, McDilda goes on a raid on Japan and he's shot down and captured. He is tortured by the Japanese and begins to give up information. 
some of the information he gives up is not necessarily accurate. But the thing he does do is they start asking him over and over and over again about the atomic bomb. What about this atomic bomb? What's going on with this? And since he had this like little lecture by this guy that knew a little bit about atomic weapons, he kind of knows about what he's talking about. So it makes sense to the Japanese that maybe this guy does know something. Well, they continue to interrogate him and torture him. And then what he decides to do is to, to start making things up. So they ask him, well, how many bombs do you have? And he goes, well, we got 100 just waiting to go. <laughs> and they ask him, well, what the, what's the next target? He goes, well, the next target's going to be Tokyo. So the Japanese start to believe this guy, that this guy really knows what he's talking about. And what happens then is the big six and the emperor are actually at this conference, and they know about Lieutenant McDilda and the 100 bombs and the Tokyo thing. And you got to think, they're sitting at this conference, and they just heard that Nagasaki's been hit. They're in the middle of Tokyo going, whoa, hey. Hmm, maybe we should head somewhere else. So it's, it's really interesting that McDilda really has an effect on, the, on this level of Japanese government. So Kido says on behalf of the emperor that look it, we got to call it quits. This is, this is out of control now. We can't, we can't do this. So they want to take immediate advantage of the Potsdam Declaration, but there will be requests for modifications. Shocker there, huh? So, because it's not acceptable as presented by the Allies. Well, why is it not acceptable? So they have the big conference keeps going on, the big six is there, and they're arguing back and forth about what conditions we should ask for. Well, they're going to ask for, some of them are going to ask for the single condition, some are going to ask for the four conditions. Just as a reminder, the single condition is that the emperor will remain sovereign ruler of Japan. Togo, Yonai, and Suzuki, those three. All right, the other three say, no, 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 we want that, but we got to have, we'll conduct our own war crime trials, we'll do our own disarmament, and God knows we don't want any occupation because you can't claim that, we can't claim we didn't lose the war if you occupy us. So they really argue about this for quite some time. So they can claim that again, that they never were defeated and they can rise again to be a great power, be a great military power. So Suzuki finally reports to Kido after this has been going on and on and on that, well, I think we've reached an agreement on the four conditions. Well, no, they haven't. That's, he basically lies to Kido. And it keeps going on. Remember, they have to go down to the next level of government, the former main government of Japan, and it's deadlocked there. So they can't come to any sort of uh, agreement. There's no unanimity in this discussion. They have to have a consensus before they can take it to the emperor. They can't get there. Suzuki says, I got an idea. Why don't we have an imperial conference and let the emperor decide? Well, that's an outrageous step because, first of all, that's not constitutional. Second of all, it's not ever been done before to have a direct intervention of the throne in this type of a matter. But that's what they're going to do. So that night, Hirohito says, I will swallow my, you know, exactly my own tears and give sanction to the proposal that indeed. Togo's group, one condition, that he will remain sovereign ruler of Japan. But if you look at Herbert Bix, and I'd highly recommend his books, he's the kind of guy that hates everybody, just so you know. But uh, he did win the Pulitzer Prize. So in the final analysis, the Kokutai meant to them, in other words, Kokutai is national polity, the position of the emperor as a living god, that 
In their moment of extreme crisis, the retention of the real, substantive, political power in the hands of the emperor so that the moderates, that's the ones, might go on using it to control the people. Well, let's face it. This isn't going to fly with the Allies. So, they got Secretary of State Burns. Uh, he's an interesting guy. I won't go into a lot of detail with him, but he's part of the people that helped write the original Potsdam Declaration. He also had been a key person in taking some language out that would have basically said that we could kind of keep the emperor, not directly as a sovereign ruler, but indeed the emperor would not be a war criminal, for example. <laughs> he's an incredible, he's a southern politician. Uh, he's a pretty, pretty smart guy. He thought he should be president because he thought he should have been vice president under Roosevelt. Uh, and he is, like I said, the guy that deleted key phrases out of the Potsdam Declaration. Well, he's in charge of this because of, he is such a good politician, and he knows that the U.S. population, because this is a democracy, isn't really very f feeling good about the emperor. 3% of the people in the, poll, in the poll say that the emperor should be retained. 17% of the people polled think the emperor should be executed. And the rest of the, basically, the population of the U.S. feels that the emperor is a war criminal and should be locked up. So it's going to be difficult to state that we should keep the emperor when the American public basically wants him executed. So, but again, the Allies have this need. We are afraid that we need to get all the Japanese to surrender because we don't want another 20 Okinawans between this 2 million Japanese soldiers that are still running around loose outside of the home islands. So the emperor might have a use. So, Burns' reply is as follows. And with regard to the Japanese government's message accepting the terms of the Potsdam Proclamation, but containing the statement, and this is the Japanese, with the understanding that said declaration does not comprise any demand which prejudices the prerogatives of his majesty as a sovereign ruler. Our position is as follows. No. <laughs> you will be subject to the Supreme Allied Commander, and the Supreme Allied Commander will be General MacArthur. But we're going to give you this, that the ultimate form of Japan will be the freely expressed will of the Japanese people. So the deal for the emperor is if you can convince the Japanese people down the road that you're an okay guy, you can keep your job. <laughs> and the armed forces you know, will remain in Japan until this is achieved. Well, the Japanese received the Burns reply, and of course they don't want this particularly the four guys, they're like, see, this is terrible. This isn't, this isn't, this isn't any deal. We're not going to do this. We're going to keep fighting. And the U.S. does another thing, is we begin to drop leaflets on Japan that tell the Japanese people that they've accepted the Potsdam Declaration with conditions. Well, the Japanese government hasn't bothered to tell the Japanese people that they've accepted this. So this causes huge consternation with the Japanese government. How are we going to get around this? Because, hey, we just told the people we're surrendering. Well, we forgot to tell them. You don't worry about it. So the emperor calls another conference, and they bring in this guy, Field Marshal Hata. And Field Marshal Hata is the man that's in charge of Ketsugo the invasion, anti-invasion of Kyushu, the defender of Kyushu. He has also been, his headquarters is in the city of Hiroshima. So he is lucky to have survived the bombing of Hiroshima. Well, Anami and the other uh, number four guys think that by bringing in Hata, they will be able to continue the war. Well, Hata says this. He had no confidence in repulsing the enemy. He did not dispute the emperor's decision to accept the Potsdam Declaration. Hata knows that he can't beat the bomb. He knows also that with the bomb, we have no need whatsoever to invade Japan. Why would we? K 
Tetsugo is dead. So the entire reason that the Japanese have been basically against peace is over. There's nothing left for them now that Ketsugo is over, realistically. So the emperor decides that he is going to have an imperial rescript. He is going to announce to the Japanese people that they accept the new Burns version of the Potsdam Declaration with the minor clarifications. And he's willing to put his fate in the hands of the Japanese people. And he's very concerned about this, but he is going to, again, make, these, make a speech, and they're going to record this on, he's not going to do it live. It's going to be a recording. So the imperial rescript, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it starts with, moreover, the enemy has begun to employ a new and most cruel bomb, the power of which to do damage is indeed incalculable. He also makes an appeal further down to the imperial ancestors. So he's very, very concerned about the maintaining the emperor and the position of the emperor down the road. He's constantly talking to Kido about the fact of um, the three regalia. How am I going to protect the three, rega three regalia? Remember we talked at the first class, the mirror, the jewel, and the sword. Those are the, like the crown jewels of Japan. They are the piece that you are the emperor if you have these. You're the legitimate emperor. He actually sends a letter to his oldest son shortly after the war. And in the letter to Akihito, who has just resigned as being emperor, as you may know, uh, he tells him that the, one of the big reasons he surrendered was to safeguard the three holy regalia. So you can see how important the position of the emperor is to the emperor of Japan. Perhaps more important to him than the lives of some of his subjects. So, Anami, they think, they're, nobody's sure about this, but they believe that Anami was part of the deal. There's going to be a rebellion of the Japanese army they are not going to allow the surrender, and they are going to break into the imperial palace and find those recordings and destroy them to prevent the uh, surrender. Also, they are going to perhaps get rid of the emperor because their duty doesn't lie necessarily to that particular incumbent emperor, but it really lies more with the imperial ancestors. So once again, even at the end of the war, you have a major, major attempt at Gekko Kujo, or government from below. Well, they can't find the records. They do kill General Mori, who's in charge of the Imperial Guard. And they fail, basically, simply enough that they, this doesn't, the, the rest of the army command doesn't go along with this and begins to suppress this re revolt. Anami commits seppuku, or ritual suicide, and he leaves a cryptic message. And the cryptic message is, with my death, humbly, I humbly apologize to the emperor for the great crime. So the question is, what is the great crime? Is the great crime the fact that he conspired against the emperor, or is the great crime the fact that they got into the war in general? And I asked uh, Rich Frank, the book I talked to you about, directly about the que this question. I said, what do you think? What do, you, do you think Anami was apologizing for this? And he thought his opinion was, nobody will ever really know, but his opinion was no, in fact, that he was apologizing for the fact that the war was started by the army in the first place. So that was indeed the great crime. So with that, when the imperial rescript is read, fortunately, all Japanese units begin to surrender throughout the world. All of the Asians, all the, so there's not going to be 20 Okinawas. And that's a huge benefit. The peace faction in Quito begins to make statements after the war. And I think this is really interesting. Uh, one condition faction led by Togo sees on the bombing as decisive justification of surrender. Quito stated, we of the Peace Party were assisted by the atomic bomb in the endeavor to end the war. 
Uh, Sakomizu here, uh, who's a cabinet secretary, said that the bomb was a golden opportunity given by heaven for Japan to end the war. We're going to get to why, okay? The atomic bombs served not only as an important cause, but an indispensable excuse for surrender. So think about this. The Japanese military could say, could save face by the fact that they weren't defeated by men, they weren't defeated by spiritual, lack of spiritual power, they were defeated by science. They were defeated not by men, but literally by the power of the gods. And it gave them an excuse to end the war. So what is the cost of the war going to be if it continues? And this is really, really where I think the, the uh, revisionists fall very short. The thinking is, is okay, well, we shouldn't use the bomb because it killed all these people, right? But what is the cost of the war if it continues going on? Yes, we were going to destroy the Japanese infrastructure. We were going to knock out all the railroads. We were going to starve the Japanese people to death. Yes, eventually the Japanese would surrender without the use of the bomb. There's no question in my mind. They would eventually revolt against their own government. How long would that take? No one knows. So. Famine breaks out in North Vietnam in 44 uh, and into 45, partly due to the French, and 500,000 to 2 million North Vietnamese starved to death. Over 1 million Indonesians starved to death during the war, during the end of the war. Robert Newman does a study on what's going on in Asia in general. Remember, you've got this Japanese army that's living off the land. They're not getting any food or any supplies from Japan anymore. They're just out there basically raping and pillaging and doing whatever they want to do. So he comes up with a number of 250,000 Asians are dying per month, non-combatants, due to the fact that the war is continuing. So the question is, are the lives of the people lost in the atomic bombings really more valuable than all these Asian lives? Because remember, the only people that can end the war are the Japanese. So the fact that we can get the Japanese to end the war that much quicker, that saves the lives of thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. Not to, I didn't even mention China, how many people are dying there on a monthly basis. What about POWs? POWs, 168,500 estimate in Japan, 15,000 of those are Americans. The Japanese have a horrendous record of treating POWs. 35% roughly of all Japanese POWs die in captivity. At the end of the war, the Japanese intentionally, we have proof of this, there's decrypted messages that went out to all Japanese units to destroy all information about their, what their treatment of POWs was. So it's, it's relatively well known that the Japanese intended to kill all the POWs had we invaded Japan. And of course, if we had starved Japan out, were they going to feed the POWs and, and not feed their own people? Of course not. So the POWs would have been exterminated. Well, even without the destruction of their railroad system, calorie count in Japan was getting very low. They started the war at only 2,000 calories per person. The average U.S. diet at that time was 3,400 calories. We were getting a little chunky, I think, but uh, I don't think I could do that many. Maybe people worked a lot harder. I'm not sure. But uh, at 45, they were down to 1,680 calories because they're running out of fertilizer. Uh, they're running out of, uh, remember I told you, most of their rice stores in Tokyo were burned to the ground. They lost almost all their backup supplies. Uh, by 46, so the war is over, they're down to 1,042 calories per person. And in Tokyo, they're down to 800 calories a day. War is over. 150,000 Japanese citizens protest in front of the Imperial Palace, begging for food. So you can see that the Japanese were correct, that if we had not invaded and just basically starved them out, at some point the Japanese people would have 
revolted. So MacArthur releases 96,000 tons of food. He gathers food up from bases all over the Pacific and starts sending food in. President Hoover, former president, requests 600,000 tons, but many, many politicians in the U.S. and people in the U.S. don't want to do this. Why should we feed the Japanese? They're our enemy. To his benefit, one of the few times I would think MacArthur did a great job, because I'm not a big MacArthur guy, um, he said that he has been trying Japanese uh, war criminals for starving POWs, and the United States must do better. And in fact, with that plea, we sent 800,000 tons of food to Japan, and we avoid starvation of the Japanese people. So we talked about the revisionist history of the bomb. We started with that. Simple enough. The standard answer is, is that we dropped the bomb because we wanted to prevent hundreds of thousands of US casualties. I personally do not believe that because I believe we never would have invaded Japan. We would have starved them out. I don't think Truman would ever have done it. And the Navy, as I mentioned in a previous class, was about to withdraw support for the invasion of Kyushu. The atomic bomb was used against Japan due to racism. The fact the bomb was going to be used against Germany and the fact that we burned German cities to the ground I think easily disproves the fact that there was a racial component to this. Yes, there were racial components to the war. I don't deny that. But the use of the bomb would have been used in Germany, and the fact is we burned German cities to the ground just as well. Uh, Hamburg, Dresden, for example. The bomb was dropped as a demonstration of the USSR to contain communist expansion. Well, that presupposes that the Japanese were about to surrender anyway, which I don't believe they were. And we had asked them at Potsdam to, get in, to still get into the war after we had already tested the bomb. So if that was the case, why would we have done that? No, we wanted the Russians in so that we didn't drop the bomb because we were going to prove something to the Russians. If we had demonstrated the power of the bomb to Japan without the use of it against a city or a military target, they would have surrendered. Well. Even after Hiroshima, many of the Japanese people, army people said, you didn't really have to worry about the bomb because we didn't have very many of them. And it wasn't that big a deal anyway as long as you were underground. So uh, don't worry about that. Japan was trying to surrender and would have if we guaranteed the position of the emperor before the bomb was used. And before the use of the bomb, the only way they would quit was if they, we would, they could feel that they had never been defeated. They were always committed to Ketsugo, to the invasion of Kyushu, to giving us that bloody nose. So, even after the use of the bomb, they're still trying to put in four conditions. You can see that indeed it wasn't just guaranteeing the emperor, they indeed wanted much more than that. And <clears throat> to finish up, the U.S. The use of the bomb quickly ended the war, saving the lives of countless Asian non-combatants. It also did another thing. If you remember unconditional surrender, the reason we had unconditional surrender was that we were hoping that by imposition of democratic governments in Japan and Germany would prevent future wars. If you think about it, and if you think about the people, Roosevelt and Churchill and the people that did that, that wanted that unconditional surrender and imposed those governments, I think they would be very pleased that 74 years later, there is no possibility of war or have been no wars with Germany or Japan. And there is no prospect in the near future at all of having a war with Germany and Japan. I think they would have been very, very pleased with that, and I think that we all should be as well. Thank you.